How are y'all doing today? Oh, come on, a little better than that. It's a late afternoon here. It's an early afternoon. All right, all right. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk together for a little while. Are you guys up for that? Yep. And just in case you're worried by virtue of seeing how much paper I brought out here, I promise you this will not be the longest speech of the day or that long of a speech. Is that a good thing? Yeah, okay, all right. So I wanted to start by thanking Loyola Marymount University for welcoming me here today. I am the product of eight years of Catholic education, and I know there were some folks here who didn't so much want me, or more importantly, Planned Parenthood here, and I wanted to thank everybody for being so gracious um, in welcoming me and welcoming Planned Parenthood. And in turn, um, I have designed a talk that really I think will respect the breadth and the depth of this audience. Um, one of the things that both research and my lived experience as CEO of Planned Parenthood Los Angeles, which just to give you a little background, we take about 2,000 calls a day. That means 2,000 people call us each and every day asking for help and information. We see another 1,000 people each and every day who are asking for clinical support and help. And again, asking for information and education. And in addition to that, we're seeing people all over the community each and every day and responding to them. So based on research, and that lived experience, I know that almost everybody in this room agrees that we all want our teens to have access to medically accurate sex education and information. Are you guys with me on that? Yes? All right, good, good. Because now's where it starts to get a little bit awkward. Come on, that's a little bit of a joke. All right. <laughs> Do you remember when you had Let's see, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to point this way. Oh, point that one. The talk? <laughs> Was it awkward? Yes. Yeah? You're probably not thinking about it as a parent. Almost all of you probably went to the place where you were a teenager. Did I more or less get that right? Yeah. Awkward, right? Well, it's going to get more awkward from here. So go to that place. I want you to think about it for a second. Did it feel a little bit like that? Do you imagine better for your sons and daughters? Do you want better for them than the way that you felt in that talk? Yeah? No? Yes, yes. OK. All right. I, I hope so. I hope so. Um, well, most of us do. But we don't all have the tools or the skills for that. One father wanted to convey to his 16-year-old daughter, your life is in front of you and sex should be low on the list. That seems a pretty reasonable thing, right? Yeah? Any parents of 16-year-olds here? <laughs> Does this seem a reasonable thing to sort of talk about and hope for for your teenager? Well, here's what she heard. <laughs> he never wants me to ever have sex with anyone. Do you all feel like that was the beginning of a really good series of talks and conversations? Yeah? Does that remind you a little bit of maybe what it was like for you? Your parents were saying one thing, your family was saying one thing, or your teacher was saying something, or your school was saying something, and you maybe heard something else or didn't hear it at all? Maybe? OK. All right. Well, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that and about some of the work that we're doing to change that dynamic. I'm going to tell you the story of Roosevelt High School the prom season, 2008. These little stick figures, which to me look a little bit like sperm, but in working on the slide, we said, no, they won't think they're sperm. <laughs> They'll know they're stick figures. Okay, 32 young women, this isn't so funny anymore, 32 young women in 2008 during prom season, the school nurse called us and said, I've got 32 positive pregnancy tests. I can't go through another prom season like this again. Planned Parenthood, can you come help me? I've talked to the administrators, and we don't typically work with Planned Parenthood like this, but we're at wit's end, and we know you're the experts. That's a sad story, right? Imagine 32 positive pregnancy tests at one moment in one high school in Los Angeles. Did any of you go to high schools where there were 32 people pregnant at any one time, to your knowledge? Can you even imagine that? So we threw everything we had at it. 
What does that mean, everything we had? We tried all kinds of things. We started, we worked with a school nurse to provide birth control on campus. We worked with the teachers to provide sex education in the classroom. We worked with the parents to provide education and workshops so that parents and families had the tools they need to talk to their kids and perhaps have a slightly better reaction than the one we described a second ago. And perhaps most importantly, we also created peer advocates. Peer advocates are students on campuses that are resources for other students. So if you don't feel like you can go to a trusted adult, or perhaps there isn't a trusted adult, you've got peers who are well informed and can help you negotiate whatever it is you need to negotiate. And then by virtue of putting all those systems in place, we were also working with the administration. So when all is said and done, the whole school, or the whole school community more importantly, was working together to make sure that the young women and men in the school had the tools they needed to prevent unintended pregnancy. Does that sound like a good thing to you? Well, as it turns out, a year later, same time frame, and what school nurses call prom season, three pregnancies. That's a pretty big difference, right? We said together, us and Roosevelt High School, Planned Parenthood and Roosevelt High School, we said, we're onto something here. We didn't just impart information the way that sex ed probably was for you and me, plumbing, here's how it works, imparting information, but we changed behavior. We hopefully delayed the first sexual experience, and we gave people tools to negotiate that sexual experience. That's a pretty incredible thing. So we said we need to study this, we need to figure out what made the difference, what helped us change that behavior, and how can we replicate it. So we've been partnering for the last five years with the University of Southern California, the Public Health Institute, and with support from the Ford Foundation to really understand how these things all come together. We're gonna to be publishing more on that this next year, but I can give you a little hint as to what makes the difference. Listening, being heard, teens feeling that there's not just one place where they can go, but there's many places where they can go. There's resources. There's not one talk, there's many talks. Does that make sense to you guys? When you think about that awkward moment, do you wish you had somebody, and maybe some of you did, that you had somebody and you could say, my mom just said this to me. I'm not sure what that meant. Can you help me figure it out? Or what am I supposed to do? My dad says never to ever have sex again, but my boyfriend says I'm supposed to and all my friends are. Be nice if you had, and I, I think I heard laughter, maybe not, but that happens a lot. Um, so I encourage you not to dismiss most, the idea that most of our teens think all their friends are having sex, and they're not, but our teens do tend to think that. Here's what we don't want to happen. We don't want young people, young women, young men to feel alone in these moments, to feel alone in these very vulnerable, potentially intimate moments where they're exploring and imagining their future. When we go into classrooms, when we go into communities, we know that not everybody wants to raise their hand and say, I'm worried about this. Not everybody can or should articulate the fears and the questions they most have about sex and sexuality. So we pass out note cards and create a variety of anonymous mechanisms for people to communicate. I share this with you, it's from a 14 year old in a classroom. And because it's very like cards we get each and every day from folks. What if a person's afraid to speak up for themselves? I want you to imagine the young woman or the young man who wrote this and think about their first kiss. Think about their boyfriend or their girlfriend says, let's do this. Think about they feel one way and their parents told them something else. Are they gonna be able to negotiate that complicated moment? Do they have the tool set to say no and expect to be heard? So when we think about questions and issues in our society, like bullying, like intimate partner or domestic violence, when we think about delaying first sexual activity, the first tool set we wanna make sure our communities have, and more importantly, our young women and our young men have, is the ability to negotiate their future, to imagine both a better future and to have the agency to move into it. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. 
And so when we, many of us took sex ed, it was, and I apologize if this is a little too graphic, it was plumbing. Today, it's about thinking about the future and creating tools so that each and every one of us have the agency to act on our values or our family's values. And I'd love to live in a world where each and every one of us felt absolutely comfortable speaking up for ourselves and our values. Would you all like to live in that world? In Brene Brown's brilliant TED Talk, which was the first one I ever saw, and I became a fan of TED Talks from there on out, she talks about vulnerability and shame. And at one point in her presentation, she, she talks about how there's no longer political discourse in this country. There's just blame, there's just my opinion, and your opinion. And what I would suggest to you is that when you feel yourself in a talk where you're right and someone else is wrong, where you feel this way about your teen, where your teen feels this way about you, that you're missing the gray area and the space for negotiation, and you're not facilitating the tools that help us move both towards fewer unintended pregnancies and, in a very idealistic moment, a truly democratic society where we're all engaged. So what we've learned from the research that we've been doing on sex ed is that the tools, the negotiation, the conversation matters. What we know, all of us in democratic society, is that participation matters. Well, participation only matters if you have agency and if you have voice. So I encourage each and every one of you to think not about the talk, but to think about many talks, to think not about your voice or her voice, but many voices, and to work towards a world where none of us feel silenced. Thank you.